Well, there's a large number of structured analytic techniques or SATs, uh, SATs, probably the most well known or at least one of the more rigorous or well-respected of these techniques is the analysis of competing hypotheses. And so I'd like to kind of introduce that today and talk through how it works and a little bit about why it is considered a good strategy that avoids some of the blind spots or cognitive biases that come with human beings and how we tend to process and think about information. So the first step in the analysis of competing hypotheses is to generate hypotheses. And this is sort of not how human beings normally go about looking for evidence and thinking about whether or not they understand a situation. Typically what we do is we identify a particular hypothesis or a particular um, expectation, and then we try to find evidence that, that says whether or not that is, is correct or not. Um, but with the analysis of competing hypotheses, we are actually gonna start by trying to come up with a comprehensive and exhaustive set of possible explanations uh, about what could be happening in a situation that sort of fills the entire policy space. So I always use the example of whether or not Iraq has weapons of mass destruction because that was in particular a important policy question in which the intelligence community looks back and said, actually, we didn't use the analysis of competing hypotheses method. We didn't adequately consider alternative hypotheses. And if we had done that, we might have seen things differently. So with the question of whether or not Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction in 2002, 2003, we could develop a range of hypotheses. So yes and no. Uh, he has them or he doesn't have them, uh, which would cover the policy space um, in terms of exhaustiveness, but maybe we could refine those a little bit further. So it could be no, he doesn't have them, uh, but also maybe no, he doesn't have them, but he wants people to think he does, or he wants some people to think he does, or some people in his, admin, in his government still think he does, right? So those could be kind of two different versions of the no hypothesis. Um, with the yes hypothesis, it could be yes, he has them, and they're deployed and ready to be used, it could be, yes, he has them, but they're hidden away somewhere. So maybe they're buried in the desert or in submarines floating off in the Persian Gulf. Not something I know if that's actually the case. I'm just making that up as a thing that plausibly could, could be part of your hypotheses. Um, or maybe he has them, but he's got them hidden in Syria somewhere, right? So we could kind of sketch those out. Um, maybe we, we sort of sketch out the full range. We say, well, these two are kind of similar enough that we'll kind of lump them together a little bit. Um, but we want to kind of get precise, comprehensive hypotheses about what could be happening in a situation. I'll just flag that we, we tend to stick to the realm of what's like possible. Um, so we don't necessarily need to include, you know, Merlin is hiding the, the weapons of mass destruction. That's why we're not picking them up. Um, if Merlin is involved, your, your hypothesis is probably outside the realm of what's, what's plausible. Um, we may need to use scenario trees to kind of sketch out, you know, sort of different branches in that yes, no, and different variations on that. But the idea is to get your, your, your comprehensive list of hypotheses as a starting point for that larger analysis. Once you have your hypotheses, you can create this sort of matrix idea of each hypothesis gets a column, and then you're gonna have rows in your matrix, and all of the evidence that you have or that you're gonna to bring to bear on this problem can be put in the matrix as a row. Uh, so, um, in the lead up to uh, the US invasion of Iraq, there was a lot of fixation on uh, Saddam Hussein trying to escape sanctions and get chlorine gas. And there was a lot of focus on uh, trying to get aluminum tubes, uh, possibly that could be used for centrifuges or some other sort of nuclear development program. Um, and so, you know, seeking aluminum tubes, seeking chlorine gas would be sort of placed as evidence in your matrix. Um, but we should also think not just about what evidence we have in front of us, but also what is the evidence that we don't have? Um, what are the kinds of things that each of these hypotheses would suggest that we should have, but maybe are missing? And it's really worth having an important conversation with yourself about each of those hypotheses and the kind of breadcrumbs that they should be leaving. Because if you don't have those breadcrumbs, what does that mean? Does it mean, well, they're out there, but there's no possible way for me to get access to them? Okay, well then that's not a big deal that I don't have them here in the stack of evidence that I'm trying to put into my matrix. 
But if I identify those breadcrumbs of, you know, a, a nuclear power plant sh or a nuclear uh, facility should require, you know, massive electrical infrastructure, and I, I have satellite images, and I can't find where that massive electrical infrastructure would be coming from, that's something that I should be able to have, and I don't have evidence of that. Why is that? Is that a sign that maybe that hypothesis actually isn't stacking up because it's not generating those breadcrumbs that it should be generating? So when we're thinking about evidence, it's, it's always useful to think about not just what you have, but what you don't have, and to ask that rigorous question about why, because the answer might actually itself be evidence of something relevant to one or more of those hypotheses. Okay, so you've got your matrix, you're filling in evidence as um, you go, and once you've got your evidence sort of populated into rows, then we're going to go through and consider each piece of evidence as a row, and we're going to go through and for each hypothesis we're going to ask the question, is this piece of evidence consistent with this hypothesis being true, or is it inconsistent? Now, consistent does not mean supportive. Consistent just means this hypothesis can be true, I can have this piece of evidence in front of me, these things, the, the world can operate this way. Uh, and so I always give the example of the sun rises in the east, could be a piece of evidence in your matrix. It's something you've observed, it's something you've documented, it's something you've included in your matrix, and it certainly is consistent with Saddam Hussein does not have weapons of mass destruction. It's consistent with him not having them, but tricking other people into thinking he does. It's consistent with him having them and deploying them. It's consistent with him having them, but hiding them, right? The sun rising in the east is consistent with all of those in that it can be true. And we can have that hypothesis be true at the same time. So consistent isn't necessarily confirming. It might be confirming, in which case maybe you wanna put an asterisk um, next to it and say, wow, this is not just, you know, consistent, but this is really seems to be pointing that this is a, 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 you know, strong evidence for this hypothesis. But what we're more interested in are those situations where the evidence is inconsistent, where you look at it and you say, I, I really don't know how these two things can square. If this hypothesis was true, this piece of evidence doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'm having a really hard time coming up with a scenario that would generate this piece of information that I have. Um, maybe it's a, you know, slam dunk again, and we give it an asterisk. Maybe it's kind of you know questionable, and so we maybe augment it with a, a plus sign or a minus sign, um, or maybe that piece of information is ambiguous. We're not quite sure yet what to make of it, um, how, how to use it, what it really tells us, and so we're going to sort of step back and not use that to drive our analysis quite yet. Okay, so this ends up being kind of involved because you are having a conversation for each piece of evidence times every one of your hypotheses. Uh, but it ends up being really important because when we go to evaluate hypotheses, we as human beings have a tendency to sort of pick a singular hypothesis and stack up evidence behind it. And what we can find is that we have lots of confirming evidence that's consistent with that hypothesis. And we can trick ourselves into believing, yes, we have lots of evidence. But that evidence could actually be consistent with a lot of hypotheses. And actually, when we think about the aluminum tubes in the... Um, the chlorine gas uh, evidence that was stacked up for to support the idea that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. There's lots of reasons why somebody might want chlorine gas. You can use it for swimming pools to chlorinate them. You can use it for drinking water so that you know children don't die of diphtheria, which is a thing that many states want chlorine for. And so seeking chlorine isn't necessarily signs of a nascent weapons of mass destruction program. It could be consistent with the world where Saddam Hussein does not have weapons of mass destruction and doesn't want weapons of mass destruction um, it, it, because it's consistent across all those hypotheses. It ends up not giving us any particularly useful information. And that's where we kind of come up with this, this next step in the matrix, right? Um, so once you've kind of gone through and done a preliminary evaluation of all your hypotheses against all of your data, then we might want to think about reworking some of those hypotheses, rewording it. Uh, maybe we find that two hypotheses that we thought were distinct are actually kind of, you know, really essentially the same thing. Or maybe with new evidence, we find that we need to differentiate um, two different hypotheses. Maybe we thought, you know, weapons of mass destruction were in Syria, and we find out, no, they're actually in uh, United Arab Emirates. I'm picking a country randomly. Uh, and But we need to sort of differentiate out those, those two different things, because it seems like there might be evidence that both of those could be plausible things to, to investigate. 
Um, and then we would want to, if we're creating new hypotheses, we want to reevaluate all that evidence against those new hypotheses. Um, as we're working, we may find new evidence. Um, we may sort of ask new questions. Right? And so we may actually go out and get more evidence um, to build in. Um, but then when we're re reworking, we're ultimately trying to simplify this down. And what the analysis of competing hypotheses encourages us to do is to go through with the rows and if a piece of evidence is consistent with all of the possible hypotheses, the sun rises in the east, or chlorine gas is being stopped by Saddam Hussein, and it actually doesn't help us differentiate whether one hypothesis is more right than the other because it's consistent with all of them, then maybe we just delete out that piece of evidence or hide it. It's not really helping us it's not really contributing anything useful to that conversation. And so what we might end up finding is that the vast majority of our evidence is actually consistent with most or all of our hypotheses and doesn't really help us in any useful way to say which of those is more or less correct. We should also have a conversation about um, the quality of that evidence and, and whether or not it's um, as, as, which evidence is more compelling than other evidence. Um, so that can be done in an informal way, or it can be done in a very like formal, like I'm going to score each of these pieces of evidence that seems to be important. Um, this is a scoring framework that is offered by the U.S. military in the uh, intelligence field manual, where you think about the reliability of the source, and you think about the credibility of the information. And so when we're thinking about the reliability of the source, we could maybe think about it on a scale of like, yes, this is a completely reliable person, worked with them before, they've always given us good information, trust them, they have no reason to you know, deceive us or, or betray us. Um, their, their incentives are to give us good information versus on the other end of the spectrum, this person has all sorts of incentives to betray us or to give us bad information. And the information they've given us before has been bad. So we're gonna score them an F where the, the original um, example got an A, or maybe we just don't know. Actually, unreliable should be an E. F is, I, I don't know. I don't have enough information to judge what's going on here. Um, credibility, however, thinks about um, the information that's being provided uh, and whether or not we, sh we are in a position to believe that that information is accurate. So we have confirmation from other sources, like let's just check that, that that piece of information seems to be solid. Um, it, it probably is true or could be true, um, seems to run counter to other things that we know. This seems improbable, right? Now we're scoring it you know, in the four and five range of, I'm not sure I really should be trusting this piece of information on its own. And so maybe we're having that conversation about the evidence in our matrix uh, to help us sort of evaluate which hypotheses start looking stronger and which start looking weaker, uh, which is ultimately where we want to go. We want to get to a point where we consider each of the hypotheses now working vertically. We go through and we look at the evidence that is there, and particularly we're looking for the the eyes the evidence that's inconsistent with those hypotheses because if you have a lot of inconsistent information that's a signal that maybe that hypothesis isn't holding up that that's a weak hypothesis and inconsistent information is ends up being much more useful for us than confirming in, or uh, consistent information and information that that could support multiple hypotheses because we don't necessarily know whether or not having lots of consistent information actually makes a hypothesis more or less true, whereas inconsistent information clearly makes a hypothesis um, seem less strong or less correct. Um, so we're focused on that, that disconfirming um, evidence and we sort of go through, and then when we present that information, we're going to be focused on um, identifying the relative ranks of these hypotheses. So this one came out as having the least disconfirming evidence um, or maybe no disconfirming evidence, and therefore I, I you know, fairly confident that it's correct. These others had problems and I'm less confident. And in fact, when we're evaluating that hypothesis and we're trying to communicate that and rank which of those hypotheses are better um, or worse, uh, we might want to use sort of these, um, this kind of language and probability scale that the intelligence community um, encourages its analysts to work with um, to talk about how uh, certain they are in a particular um, hypothesis being accurate, you know, you're almost completely certain um, would be, you know, 95 to 100 um, for maybe your strongest hypothesis. If, if you have that level of confidence, it might be lower. Um, but and then for the other hypotheses, maybe they seem unlikely, which is not to say that they're wrong. It's just to say 
that it's a much less likely scenario, maybe 20%, maybe 30%, um, that that hypothesis could be true. And so when you present your hypotheses um, in this way, one of the real advantages is that policymakers can look at that and say, wow, it seems like there's a strong hypothesis, but it also seems like there's a second possibility that is also consistent with the evidence. And that is really important to know because again, human beings have a tendency to just stack up information behind what they already believe, to find confirming evidence for what they already believe, and may miss the fact that there's an alternative possibility that also looks really strong. And the analysis of competing hypotheses is designed to identify those other possibilities, to identify that they also have lots of information backing them up, and to push that information out to policymakers so that they can recognize that I can't just rely upon my own bias of what I think is, is going on, but there's actually um, more nuance to this situation.